All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to week three of Bible Project 2022-2023. You guys have made it this far. At this point, like, if you've made it to week three, you can make it to the end, is what, is what I always say. It gets only easier from here, right? People who have done it before? Right. Isaiah, Leviticus, Job, easy books to get through. Uh, hey, show of thumbs, how has reading been going? Thumbs up, I cranked the reading all week, hit it all. Thumbs down, didn't read a single day, but I am here somewhere in the middle. Cool. Hey, I, I appreciate even the thumbs down. Like, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're here. I think you'll get more out of showing up and not reading than if you don't read and don't show up. So um, it's great that you're here and you're also going to be exposed to a lot of scripture. Like, a lot of what we do in this class is we read together. Um, also, show of thumbs on comprehension. Thumbs up. I feel like I really have a good grasp of everything I've been reading this week. Thumbs down. I feel lost, intimidated, and scared somewhere in the middle. Like, I know this is English words, but I don't understand what it's saying. <laughs> and out of honesty, anyone uh, actually reading the Psalms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be honest. Last year, I think I read like five of the Psalms, and I was... I was always just reading the, reading the text. I read Psalm 1 and 2 and 8, 110. Definitely didn't read the super long one. What is that? Uh, 119. Yeah, I didn't even get close to that. So it's okay. We are imperfect people. Sometimes we miss reading. Sometimes we don't read. But rather than trying to play catch up, I need you all to master the reset. Master the reset. So maybe you're here and you're like, man, I really honestly haven't read much of Genesis at all. No worries. Just pick up with tomorrow's reading. And if anything, in two days, uh, I believe it's two days, we start the book of Exodus. So it's a brand new start, brand new beginning to, to pick up a fresh and a new and begin a new book. So master the reset. Don't try and play catch up. Read what you can each day. Don't try to turn this into some sort of checklist. You do not earn your salvation by reading scripture, although scripture does show you your need for salvation. Uh, we're going to finish the book of Genesis this morning. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll, we'll get going. Uh, Father, thanks for this morning, and, and thank you for, for carrying us for these last few weeks of, of encouraging our souls and our spirits to open your word and to read and to, to wrestle with it and to try to understand it to the best of our ability as, as, we are, as we are guided and illuminated by your spirit. And God, thanks for this time where we can come together and we can think together and question together. And, and God, you can shape us through your people and your community. So God, this morning, we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear how your word in Genesis speaks to us. We love you and we need you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last week, we, we got uh, basically through the Abraham story. We looked at the covenant that is made with Abraham. And if I wanted to read about the covenant that's made with Abraham, I would turn to what chapters in the book of Genesis? 12, 15, 17. 12, 15, 17. If you weren't here last week, college students, remember those three chapters, Genesis 12, 15, 17, the Abrahamic covenant. You can think about it as Genesis 12 being the proposal for the covenant. Genesis 15 is like the, the covenant ceremony where they say the I do's. And then Genesis 17 is the exchanging of the covenant sign. Although it's a little more complicated than putting a ring on your finger. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Um, so the, the story of Abraham is, is kind of a, a mixed experience. Uh, sometimes he's awesome. Sometimes he's doing very questionable things. And I keep asking the question, Abraham, good guy, bad guy. And the point I'm trying to, to get across is he's a human. He's a human. It's not that he's like the hero or the villain. He's a human. Sometimes he makes really good decisions because he's made in the image of God. Sometimes he makes really bad decisions because just like his ancestors and just like our ancestors, Adam and Eve, we listen to the serpent and we take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We see something as being good for ourselves. So we seize it or we take it for ourselves, and then we run away with it. So uh, anyone fits into this category of human. The, the two main players in the Bible is God and humans. The Bible is a story about God relating to humanity, and humanity is always a mixed bag. 
Except for when we get to Joseph. He's kind of awesome in this book. It's kind of questionable whether or not he ever has moments where he's he's bad like Abraham was, but we'll we'll get there. So we left off in Genesis chapter 22. It's kind of the culmination of the Abraham story where God tests Abraham. You're told in verse 1 of Genesis 22, which is where where God asked Abraham to offer up his one and only son as a sacrifice. We are told as readers from the beginning that it is a test. Now, it's still an uncomfortable story. God is asking someone to sacrifice his son. And then later on in, in texts like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we'll hear that God has never even thought of things like child sacrifice when the, when the people of Judah are sacrificing their children to Molech by fire. And God says, this would never even come to my mind. So it, it raises the question, what, you know, what is going on here? But we know as readers, this is a test. This is a test. We're not going to read the story. Um, I sent out a, a short video. Maybe you watched it. Maybe it helped. But some details that I think are important. Important. He says, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Only son? What about Ishmael? (laughs) You know, the firstborn. So Isaac is called the only son, even though Abraham does have other sons. So I think that's interesting. He's not only called the only son, but the one whom you love. And he says, go to the land of Moriah, the land of Moriah, we actually saw at the beginning of the story of Abram when when he goes to the tree of uh, Moriah, Moriah, Moriah. It's the same Hebrew word, uh, just just a little bit of a, a twist on it, but it refers to vision or sight. The this this word. So he's going to the land of seeing, the land of sight, and he goes there and he, he's told to go up onto a mountain. To offer his son. And all of it that in the story takes place, verse 4, on the third day. There is that section in 1 Corinthians 15. You don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 15, where, where Paul writes, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So what Paul is saying, uh, the, the gospel that he believes and proclaims the gospel of Jesus is one that is according to the scriptures, specifically for Paul, the Old Testament. And he, what he's saying is that the Old Testament says that the Christ, the Messiah, would be raised on the third day. But there's no specific text that says something like, the Messiah will be raised on the third day. So how does scripture say that then? Part of what this class I'm trying to do is not only help you hear what scripture is saying, but help you see how scripture says it. I want you to see how scripture says it. So the way scripture says the Christ would be raised on the third day is it uses patterns. It uses what scholars call typology. So rather than a source text that just simply says the Christ will be raised on the third day, instead you get stories, stories that take place on the third day. So this story takes place on the third day and Abraham, you know, he's not really sure what's going on. But as he's talking to people, uh, he, he tells his, his men in verse five, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Is, is Abraham just pulling a fast one? He doesn't want them to know what's going on. Or does Abraham actually believe that? Does Abraham somehow believe that they're going to go and perform this act of worship And both of them really will return. So remember what was promised to Abraham with regards to Isaac. One of your offspring will bring blessing to all the families of the earth. And then they tried to seize that blessing for themselves 
Abraham and Sarai, and they had uh, Ishmael. And God said, no, it's not going to be through Ishmael that your offspring are named. It's going to be through Isaac. Isaac has not had any kids yet. And God has made a promise to Abram, Abraham with regards to Isaac. Abraham believes that God will carry out his promise. He doesn't quite understand how, but he really does believe that's going to be through Isaac, that all his offspring are named. And therefore, Isaac has to have children. So Isaac can't possibly die and stay dead. So that's why in Hebrews chapter 11, the author of Hebrews is reflecting on this. And he says uh, in verse 17, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he, who, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall all your offspring be named. He considered, so what Abraham did is he, he logically deduced that God was able to, even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back from the dead. So Genesis 22, with the lamb being provided in the place, the ram being provided in the place of Isaac, Isaac who is surely about to die, and then something is is given in the place of him. Abraham is receiving back his son from death, he, it's almost as if Isaac is being resurrected from the dead, and it's all on the third day. Genesis 22 is a story about how a substitute is provided, and there's a resurrection on the third day. In accordance with the scriptures. Yeah, it is cool, huh? Yeah. And you just have to slow down and read some of these details. Um, you know, sometimes we think, well, Isaac's called, I think, a boy at some point, but um, when they get to the place, he laid the, oh, wait, wait, before that. I am a boy. Um, well, I'm look, he puts the wood on Isaac's back to carry it. Mm, stay here with the donkey. He took in his hand fire. Six. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and his knife. So Abraham's old, and he puts the wood on the back of his son to carry it. So Isaac is at least old enough, big enough, strong enough to carry enough wood to make an, an altar burnt offering on top of a mountain. So this sa- the same phrase that refers to, to Isaac here as being um, a, a boy is the same phrase that's going to be used in Genesis 37, about Joseph, who's 17. So Isaac is probably like an older teenager at this point. He's very aware of what's taking place, and he's willing the entire time. He even has that moment where he's like, hey, we got the wood, we got the fire, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, you know what? God will provide for himself a sacrifice. And Isaac's like, okay. So even Isaac in the story is a willing Sacrifice. And just out of curiosity, if you're if you're interested, this word wood that keeps showing up in verse six, he took the wood and put it on Isaac's back. And then in verse nine, he he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. It's the Hebrew word etz. It just simply means tree. So the willing sacrifice is placed on the tree. Oh. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, the, the ram is provided in place of Isaac. So a substitute is provided for the life of the son. So this is just how the Bible is communicating to us. And if we, if we slow down a little bit and, and we, we read through these things carefully, uh, it's not that we're finding secret or hidden meaning in these texts. We're actually just seeing what the text already says and how it is saying it. Uh, but meditation, you know? Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. What, what's a thicket? Anyone? Like, like a thorn bush. 
So the the substitute, ha, its head is wrapped in thorns. What 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 does Jesus have put on his head? A crown made out of thorns. thorns. And what what is the result of the curse in Genesis three? That's going to come up from the ground. Thorns. So Jesus wears the curse in his crucifixion, and, and the ram here, the substitutionary ram, is caught in the the curse of sin. So all all these are just patterns that that build to Christ. And this is how the Old Testament is communicating. If you pay attention for things like on the third day, you will see lots of stories. And, you know, some of them, it's just uh, the third day. But if you slow down and say, are there any redemptive patterns in this story? You will begin to see them. Uh, Women in the women's uh, Esther study right now, uh, what day, how many days does Esther fast before going into the chamber? Three days. She fasts for three days, and then she goes into the king's court, and she intercedes for the life of the people. Intercession for the life of the people is made on the third day in the book of Esther. All right, that one's for free. (laughs) Okay. Uh, After the Abraham story, this is the last time Abraham has God speak to him. Is that story right there. It's the last time he hears God speak. Kind of sad. Kind of intense. Then there's Isaac. Isaac marries Rebecca, whose name is kind of like a, a, a scrambling of, of the, the word blessing. And she, her name is just said over and over again. Genesis 24, it's the longest chapter in Genesis. And it all takes place around a well. Pretty interesting, but we don't have time. Okay. But then Isaac... Uh, Remember, Isaac was the second born, but he is the one who was chosen. Then Isaac and Rebekah, they're also going to have two sons. The older name, is, the older one is going to be Esau. The younger one is going to be Jacob. So let's look at the birth of Esau and Jacob. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son, Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. I'm in chapter 25, if you guys are still looking. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. The two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Before they're born, before they've done anything, God has chosen Jacob and not Esau. That's One of Paul's big arguments in the book of Romans. They have not done anything. And yet God has chosen the younger and not the older. So the rest of the drama of Esau and Jacob, it's like this this whole story where Jacob is trying to seize for himself the blessing and the birthright. And it's just like, you idiot. Like, you already have it. You were already given it by God. God has already chosen you. You're, You're not seizing this for yourself. You're not manipulating God's plan in any way. Like you're actually playing right into his hand. He has already chosen this to be how it's going to be. But here again is that same pattern of subversion where it's the younger born who's actually the one being chosen. It started with uh, most prominently Cain and Abel. Cain is older, yet God shows favor to Abel, the, the younger. And then the older brother, how does he feel about that? Not good. So what he does is he strikes him down in the field. He kills him. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. 
Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. So there, there's some strife in the marriage relationship because of these two sons already. And, and Rebecca probably loves Jacob in, in a way because she knows that God has chosen him. But she's also going to try to manipulate the plan as we keep reading. Here's the pastoral thing to point out. Uh, we read in verse 20, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebecca. And she couldn't conceive, so he kept praying for her. And he was 40 years old. And it says that the Lord uh, answered him and granted his prayer. And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. But how old was he when she actually conceived and gave birth? 60. 20 years of prayer. God answered the prayer. And she did conceive. But it was 20 years. Some of y'all have been praying for 20 years. It does not mean that God will not answer your prayer. Some of us who are younger, we pray for like 20 minutes and we're like, what the heck, God? (laughs) Where is it at? So God does hear the prayers of his people and God does answer his people's prayers. Sometimes it takes much longer than we would like it to, though. Okay, what is with all these details that we're given? Esau, he's, he's red, he's hairy, he's a skillful hunter. He's a man of the field. Jacob, he's holding Esau's heel. He's a quiet man. He's dwelling in tents. Thoughts? Like, interesting details? Yeah. Red and hairy, yeah. We will read about someone else who's red, or I think at least the ESV translated it as ruddish. Uh, and that's David. David's ruddish. It's like a reddish tint to the skin. Like, oh, that's interesting. He came out red. But his body like a hairy cloak. That's a little weird. Um, it is weird. So, <laughs> um, Sha'ar is hairy. Sha'ir in Hebrew is goat. And when Jacob deceives his father, what is he going to put on his skin? Goat skin. Like, why is he put goat skin on his body? Ah, because his brother is like a goat. He comes out like all goat-like, all hairy and furry. Um, so they call him Esau, which is the, the, word, the letters for hairy, but just like twisted up a little bit. But Sean, also uh, the fact that Esau gave up his birthright so... Oh, yeah. So quickly. Such a knucklehead, right? But then you hear about Jacob, who we know is the chosen one. Not thinking about Star Wars or Harry Potter at all in my head when I say that. But he's holding Esau's heel, which is Yaakov means like to grab heel. But it also means to deceive or to cheat. Like... The servant, the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall strike or grab his heel. The the snake was said to be a heel grabber. And the way you're introduced to Jacob is like a snake. Is he going to be kind of snake-like in this story and deceive people? Yeah, all the time. And yet, He's the one who was chosen. So the tension of the drama as you read through the Jacob story is, is he ultimately going to end up just being a snake or is he going to end up being the offspring of the woman? That's like the the crazy tension that you're wrestling through the entire time. But he's introduced like a snake. He is one who deceives. When they grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter. Have I heard of any skillful hunters? In the book of Genesis so far. I have. Just, just once though. Not Cain. He, he was a worker of the ground. Oh, there's two. Yes, Ishmael. There's one before that though. Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. Nimrod is, is called a skillful hunter. Genesis chapter 10 verse 9. And Nimrod, which means rebel what that name means. Uh, Mr. Rebel goes on to build a few cities. Anyone remember? 
Babylon and Assyria. Babylon and Assyria, good guys, bad guys. Bad guys. Like read through the Bible there, the bad guys of the story through and through. So your introduction to Esau, he, when Esau grows up, he is a lot like Nimrod. He's a skillful hunter and he's called a man of the field. That's the other description. What does that call to mind, a man of the field? On his own, like the isolation, someone who just like wanders in the field. Ben, Cain. Yeah, he was he was a worker of the ground. Cain is a worker of the ground. Uh, after uh, Papa Adam, who was the first gardener, um, but it's interesting that it's the word field and not ground. So it's just a common word for field. You know, like if we looked outside, that's a field. Um, but so far in the book of Genesis, the the word field has only been used in certain occasions. I believe I have a list. Uh, it's the place of un- uncultivation in Genesis 2.5. It's like the uncreated state that then God brings life out of in the garden. It's also in Genesis 2.19 and 3.1, it's the place of the snake. The snake was more crafty than all the beasts of the field. And then in Genesis 4, 8, it's the place of murder where Cain takes out his brother. He strikes him down in the field. And then you don't hear the word field again for a very long time until you get to Genesis 23. And there's all that detail about Abraham buying a piece of the field to bury Sarah, his wife. So it becomes the place of burial or death. It just means field. It's just a common word. But but one of the things that we do in biblical studies and just critical reading is you look at how a word is used in context. So the book of Genesis, in its context, we're reading through it and we think to ourselves, well, how has the word field been used so far? And so far, the only ways it's been used is to communicate a place of uncultivation, the place of the snake, the place of murder, the place of death and burial. So... The question is, you know, is Esau an Adam gardener or is he the cane killer who's going to try and strike down his brother? Huh? Like, what's the drama about in about Cain about Esau and Jacob? He's trying to kill his brother and Jacob runs away. Then we hear that Jacob, these ones might be a little bit harder to see, but Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in his tents. And the funny preacher joke is to be like, you know what? Uh, Rebecca really loved him because he was a mama's boy who always stayed inside and liked to cook. All right, that's not what's going on here. Maybe. I could be wrong, I guess. Maybe that is what's going on. Uh, But I don't think so. Quiet man. The word for quiet here is is tom, which is usually only applied to animals to communicate how they are blameless or without blemish. So a blameless or without blemish sacrifice. Some people who are called tom or, or blameless are people like Noah has been called this. Uh, remember, he was, he was blameless and he was righteous. Um, Daniel in the book of Daniel will be called this. And there's a few others here and there. But we hear that Jacob is, is a Tom-ish, a quiet man or a blameless man. And you're like, oh, well, is he a heel grabber or is he blameless? That's the question. But both Harry, which sounds like goat, and the word Tom are words that are heavily associated with sacrifices in the book of Leviticus when we get there. So they're both being introduced kind of like sacrifices in some way. And then we hear that he is a man, not only a, a quiet man, but one dwelling in tents. Anyone remember that phrase? If you did, I'd be so impressed, but we, only, we heard it twice. We heard it in Genesis 4.20. The tent dwellers are shepherds. Uh, Ada bore Yabal, J's make a yes sound in Hebrew. Ada bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So t- tent dwellers are shepherds because they're, you know, they, they move along with their sheep. They take the tent down, they go on to the next spot with the, the sheep, they put the tent up. And then we also hear it in Genesis 9.21. Oh, not 9.21. Must be 922. I'll just go there real quick. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. 926. When Shem is blessed, blessed be the God, be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth 
and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. So the only time we've heard the phrase dwelling in tents was associated with shepherds in Genesis 4 and with the one who is blessed in Genesis 9. And now we hear it again with with Jacob, who is the one who's blessed. And it turns out he goes and he lives with Laban. And what's his profession there? A shepherd. Okay. So we have two brothers. One is a man of the field and the other one is a shepherd. Have I heard of any brothers who one was a man of the field and the other one was a shepherd? Cain and Abel. And how does the Cain and Abel story go? Oh, lots of division. They try and fight each other. Okay, that's how this story is going to go as well, except for it's going to be like blown out of proportion. It's going to be a lot of fun to read. So first, Esau sells his birthright. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, which I don't know why you would sell your birthright for stew anyways. That's disgusting. Maybe a rack of ribs. But Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew. In Hebrew, it doesn't say red stew. It just says red, red. And red, red is Edom, Edom. That's why they call him Edom. Get it? (laughs) Therefore, his name was called Edom. You probably have a footnote in your Bible. Edom sounds like the Hebrew for red. So he sells his birthright for something that is red. So that becomes his nickname. And his nickname is then what the nation that he spawns is called. And we get that genealogy in, in chapter uh, 34 of Genesis. And Jake, Jacob said to him, uh, how about you sell me your birthright for the soup? And Esau said, I'm about to die. What use is a birthright to me? So Jacob said, swear to me. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, also pretty gross. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way thus. Esau despised his birthright. So we have the very first story. We've exited descriptions of these two. First story of them. And how how was Jacob introduced to us? Grabbing the heel, kind of like a snake. And what he does here is he tricks his brother, the firstborn, out of his birthright by deceiving him with some food. How does Genesis 3 go with the serpent? Food. Take from the tree and eat it. Yeah? Yeah? Serpent. Heel grabbing Jacob. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Doesn't that give you great comfort? Yeah. We are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the point's not to be like, avoid Jacob's in your life. The point is, you're Jacob. You're Jacob. You need to be rescued by by someone. You need to be wrestled down and to have your hip blown out. Not literally, hopefully, for my silver hair saints here. All right? I don't want your hips going out. So then there's a famine, and Isaac goes out of the land, and he has this, like, literally the same interaction with Abimelech as his father Abraham did, where he's like, hey... Rebecca's my sister. Why don't you take her? And they just replay the same thing. Uh, There are some of those key words that she's attractive or she's good. And they they saw and things like that. But we're going to skip it. Go ahead and turn to 27. So Jacob has already deceived for the birthright. Now he's going to deceive for the blessing. Uh, specifically the Abrahamic blessing, the, the covenant blessing to be passed on from Isaac to him. Isaac was pretty old and he couldn't see. He was a little blind, but he calls Esau, his older son, and his son said to him, here I am. He says, hey, I'm really old. I don't actually know when I'm going to die, but it's probably going to be really soon. So grab your weapons, your quiver, your bows, I want you to go out to the field and hunt some game for me and prepare me a really, really good meal of food such as I love. And then bring it to me that I may eat and then I'll bless you in exchange before I die. Well, Rebecca was listening to this this whole interaction. So as Esau went out to the field, she runs over, she grabs Jacob and she says, obey my voice. Listen to my voice. 
come on. All right? Adam and Eve. And, and then later on, uh, Abraham and Sarai with Hagar. Obey my voice. Run out, grab some of them from the flock, bring them in, and I'm going to cook up some delicious food as your dad really, really likes. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau, he's a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only listen to my voice and go. Bring them to me. This is the last time that Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, will see each other and talk. It's the last time. So the curse kind of does come upon Rebecca. Last time they see each other. Uh, You guys know what a double entendre is? It's when you say one thing with two different meanings. So it's clever. It's ironic that Esau, he says Esau is a hairy man, but I'm a smooth man. This expression, smooth man, in in biblical poetry means someone who's deceitful or says flattery with their lips that they don't actually mean it. And we've actually read some of them already. Uh, Psalm 12, 2 and 3. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With smooth lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all smooth lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. So someone who's deceitful with their words. And he's about to go in and be deceitful with his words. Like, he really is a smooth man in two ways than one. He has smooth skin, and he's smooth with his deceitful and lying words. Some other, some other texts, if you want to take notes, Proverbs 5.3, Proverbs 26.28. It also pops up in Ezekiel and also in Daniel. To, to refer to someone as being smooth is to refer to them being deceitful or, or cunning with their, their words. So, ladies? Watch out for those smooth men out there. They're not to be trusted. So he went and he took them and he brought them to his mother and they, they prepared this delicious food just like his father loved. Then Rebecca took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth parts of his neck. And she put delicious food and the bread with which he had prepared into his hand for her son, Jacob. So the way Jacob is going to go and deceive his father is with food and with clothing. All right, so we're getting an added layer to this story. It's not just with food now, it's also with some sort of garment. There's going to be just deception with a garment. There's going to be deception with a garment. Okay, but he is the snake who is deceiving. So he goes in, you know, there's that weird stuff like Isaac can't really see him, but he's like, you sound like Jacob, but you smell like Esau. You must be Esau and this food's really good. So let me bless you. And then he he blesses him. They're, they're in the tent, tent. It's like dark. You can't see. And then Isaac is in the tent. He's eating and he's drinking wine. And then it goes bad. You get it, you get it. So Isaac said to him, come near, let me kiss you. And then he smells him. He's like, oh yeah, you smell just like the field. And may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Those are expressions for abundance. You know, the, the dew of heaven, like rain for the crops, the fatness of the earth. Um, that'd be for like livestock that you have. And then uh, plenty of grain and wine. That's the harvest that you have from it. So be plentiful and, and abundant in your possessions. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. We're going to hear this expression again later with a guy named Joseph. And then a guy named, J- uh, a guy named Judah and his son. That's blessed. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. So the exchange happens, and then Esau comes in a little bit afterwards, and he's like, what, you already blessed my brother? And he starts crying, and he's, he's trying to get his birthright back through tears, or his blessing back through tears, but he cannot attain it. And that's what the author of Hebrews references when he says, 
uh, through tears, he sought it, but could not find it. It's not that Esau's seeking repentance and could not find it. He's seeking the blessing, but cannot attain it, even though he's crying. He regrets his decision, but he's not repentant of it. Okay, questions so far? All right, so that's how we're introduced to Esau and, and Jacob. Jacob is kind of a, kind of a snake. He's kind of a snake. Uh, then let's go to chapter 28. So because of this, because uh, Esau has not only stolen the birthright, but now has stolen the blessing, uh, look at verse 41 of 27. Uh, now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, you know, one day my dad's going to die. And when that day comes, after my dad is gone, then I will kill my brother, Jacob. Bum, bum, bum. Cain and Abel. Here it goes. One, one son was shown favor. The younger son was shown the favor and received the blessing. And the older one is angry about that and hates. And because of that, wants to strike him down and kill him. So because of this, Jacob picks up and leaves. He flees, never sees his mom again. He's going out of the land and he's going to go to his uncle Laban, Rebekah's brother, outside of the land. While he is leaving the land, he has this apocalyptic dream where real, the, the curtains of reality are pulled back and he sees something that's true. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran and he came to a certain place and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. It's taking place at night. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder. Or maybe you have a footnote with ladder. Flight of steps. We've seen some sort of flight of steps set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to the heavens. So from earth to sky. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, your offspring... In you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is the Abrahamic covenant being passed on from, by God now to Jacob. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and sh said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He has this experience where he's just in a, a pretty common place. And then he has this experience with God. And his reaction is not, whoa, God showed up here. He says, God is in this place. And I just didn't realize it. God is in this place. And I just didn't realize it. Right? So his, his dream that he's having He got some green. So he's catching some Z's. Put his head on a little rock, a little pillow. And then all of a sudden, he has this like really crazy dream where he, what he sees is a staircase going up to heaven. It's the place where heaven and earth is meeting, is what he is seeing. And the angels are ascending and descending. They're going up and down. Like this is the place where heaven and earth intersect with each other, where they meet. And his reaction is, wow, God is in this place and I didn't even realize it. But it's this place where heaven and, and earth meet. Uh, the staircase, this is how, how ancient temples are designed. They're, they're called ziggurats. Uh, we could Google it real quick. 
So uh, in Genesis 11, the tower, tower of Babel, it's probably a ziggurat because the plains are really, are really flat. So a ziggurat is a man-made mountain because mountains reach up to the skies and it's where the skies and the earth meet each other. So a ziggurat is a man-made mountain structure where heaven and earth meet, where you encounter the gods. And they have these huge staircases that reach up to the heavens, where then you can encounter the divine. Um, there are some good pictures from a distance. I mean, this one's kind of in rubbles, but it kind of just looks like a mountain. Yeah? So from further away, these are these little man-made mountains that sit out in the wilderness. Look at that thing. Isn't that crazy? But a staircase that goes up to the heavens. And this is what he's encountering, a, a very real staircase to the heavens where, where the divine and human realm, they intersect with each other and where he can experience God in that very moment and, and have a conversation with them. And he describes it as um, seeing the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And in the email, I gave you some extra credit homework to go to the gospel of John. Oops, not jogging. No one likes jogging. Okay. Jesus says in John chapter one, Jesus answered him, verse 50, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you're going to see a lot better things than that? And he said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened, Ezekiel chapter one, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man, which is himself, Daniel chapter seven. So he uses this text to refer to himself, that Jesus says that the place where heaven and earth meet, the place where the divine realm intersects with the human realm, he says, yeah, that place is me. You want to encounter God? Here I am. And that's how Jesus uses this story from this obscure story from Genesis chapter 28, how Jesus uses it. Okay, so that's <clears throat> Jacob leaving the land. He leaves the land. Uh, then, oh, and also he renames this place Bethel. Bethel, house of God. And it used to be called Lutz, which has two different meanings. It means almond tree. And it also, I think it's, uh, oh, it means crookedness. And cunning. So the place that used to be called crooked or cunning, like deceitful, gets renamed to be House of God. Just like in a few short stories, the guy whose name is Deceiver is going to be renamed Israel. Okay, then he goes, he gets to Laban, and lo and behold, he sees a really beautiful woman who's interacting with the sheep. She's a shepherdess, and her name is, is, is Rachel, which means little lamb. Rachel is a, is a ewe lamb. That's what the name means. And he's like, man, she is beautiful. I want to marry her. So he's talking to Laban. He's like, definitely, can I please have your daughter in marriage? And he's like, Laban's like, absolutely you can. Just work for me for seven years. And at the end of seven years, we'll celebrate by I'll give you Rachel in marriage. And he's like, fantastic. And it says the seven years flew by. They were but nothing for him because of his great love for the little ewe lamb. Then the seven years is up. And what happens? Yeah. He, gets, he gets Leah instead. He gets deceived. Ah, oh, now, now the deceiver is the one who's being deceived by Laban. And it, so instead of giving him Rachel, she, he gives him Leah. And let's see, where are their description of their name? You know, like, Leah is... Weak, weak eyed. 16. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the name of the older was Leah or Leah, which means cow. And the name of the younger was Rachel, little you lamb. Leah's eyes were weak. You're like, what does that mean? But Rachel was beautiful in appearance and form. A few other people who are going to be described as, as good in form and appearance. Joseph. David, Daniel, might be something there. 
Uh, but if the description of Rachel is about her form and appearance, then this, the description of Leah is also about her form and appearance. It's not that she has bad sight, but that she's a bad sight. That's like what is being said here. Like she's not the best to look at is, is what's going on here. Um, so naturally Jacob's a little frustrated. He's like, what the heck? You said you'd give me Rachel, but you've given me Leah. And it's like, well, it's not our custom to give the younger over the older. But if you work for me for another, another seven years, then I'll give you Rachel. So he agrees. He gets Rachel right away, but then works for another seven years. So the deceiver just keeps getting deceived in the story. They start having children. They have actually lots of children. And each of them had a female servant. And this is the origin of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's even like reading it without a huge Bible background. You're like, this doesn't seem like the best scenario, family scenario. So... The nation of Israel, the origin of the nation of Israel is being painted in this kind of light where you're like, oh, not great, not great. And this is how the Bible speaks of the Bible's people. It, it's, it's not sugarcoating things. Uh, it's not, as it were, whitewashing history to make them look like superstars. It's actually showing their failures and their flaws. Um, but Jacob, you know, he grows in prosperity as he's working as a shepherd. Um, and there's all that weird stuff with the sticks. We don't have time for it. It's weird though. It's super weird. Uh, but then Jacob flees from Laban and he goes back to the land. And as he's uh, fleeing, going back to the land on the third day, uh, he, he's running, he's going and... Um, here in, I believe I'm in chapter 20 or 31 in chapter 31, he's going back into the land. Uh, oh no, I think I, I think I skipped it. Oh, it's in 32. So Jacob's on his way. He's, he's leaving Laban. They have their interaction. He's now going back into the land. So remember when he was leaving the land, he had the Jacob's ladder moment. He's like, wow, God dwells here. Now he's going back into the land and he has another vision. Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, ah, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place two camps, two camps. So he has a camp and it would appear that God has a camp and it's in an overlapping space. It's convergent space, two camps. And Jacob then sent messengers before him to Esau, and the story continues. But you have this, this little detail that as he's re-entering the land, he has this uh, another encounter with the divine realm. It's establishing the land as being this place where God's people are going to dwell in the midst of God's presence. He was out in the east. He's now entering, going west. Okay, then let's skip to... Um, the end of chapter 32. Oh, is this right? No, I skipped it. Where, where's him wrestling with? Oh, wow. I, I was zoomed way ahead. All right. End of 32, starting in verse 22, we have this strange encounter of the night. Uh, the same night of all this, he arose and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children. And he hasn't had Benjamin yet at this point. His 11 children, he crossed the ford of the Jabbok, of the Yabok. He took them and he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man, unnamed, unknown man, wrestled with him until the breaking of dawn. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was exploded from the wrestling. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. That's the man speaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's already blessed at this point. Like he's already been blessed. But he doesn't believe it. Yeah, probably. I mean, definitely. Yeah, Jacob's a little, little insecure. Yeah. Yeah. So on one hand, like he's already blessed. But he doesn't believe it. And that, that's, making him, that's making him make really bad decisions. The fact that Jacob doesn't believe that he's blessed. 
is making him make bad decisions. You're already blessed. But believing that you're not blessed makes you make bad decisions. Okay. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel means to strive with God. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel or face of God, saying, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, it's the same, same name, face of God, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Interesting little detail there. So they're wrestling. We're just introduced to this as some man. Some unknown man, but what Jacob clarifies for us is that he's wrestling somehow with God Himself uh, at nighttime in this this watery place, and then he gets named afterwards. Now the man says, "You have striven with God, and man, and have prevailed; like you've been victorious." But in verse thirty two, uh, verse thirty one, he walks away limping. Did he win? He's a wounded victor. A wounded victor. And then he goes, he meets his brother. They embrace. He falls on his neck. He kisses them and they wept. That's going to be a phrase that you hear uh, today in today's reading in the, the Joseph narrative. And then the story of Jacob concludes. You have it concluding with chapter 34, or excuse me, 35. No, 36, Esau's descendants. Just a long list of Esau's descendants. It's really interesting. Uh, in the middle there, you have the story of, of the defiling of Dinah, which uh, we can spend a lot of time on. There's lots of interplays with like, who's in the wrong in the story? What's going on? And all of them in a way are kind of right, but kind of wrong. They all seem to be kind of obeying Torah in different ways which is really interesting, but we don't have time for it. Here's what I want to do. I want to spend some time, not just you hearing me, but you hearing each other. So I have some questions. We're going to turn to the story of Joseph. And what I want you to do is I want you to turn with your tables. So rows one and two, you're going to turn and talk to each other. Rows three and four, you're going to turn and talk to each other. And that group in the back, you guys are going to turn and talk to each other. All right. So rows, rows five and six. So table discussion, table discussion, table discussion. I want you to tell each other your names. I want you to know who you are. But then for uh, five to 10 minutes, just kind of talk through these questions with your group. Just recount the overall stories of Genesis 37, 38, 39. Don't read them. Just try to do it from memory. See what you can get. Discuss with your group why would the Joseph story start and then abruptly be interrupted with Genesis 38. And then discuss, do Genesis 37, 38, 39 have anything in common? All right, so there's your assignment. We're going to talk for five to ten minutes. I'm going to turn some music on if I can. Yeah. All right. Introduce yourselves and then get talking.
All right. Let's reconvene. If you didn't get through them, it's okay. Let's reconvene on this and talk about it a little bit. Okay, Genesis 37, uh, youngest brother Joseph is betrayed by his brothers. He's thrown into a pit and sold into slavery where he's drawn up out of the pit and taken down into Egypt. Genesis 38 is a story of, of Tamar and Judah where, where Judah is withholding his sons from Tamar. He's withholding uh, the right of leveret marriage. And instead, something happens where, where Tamar deceives him, acting as a cult prostitute, leading to Judah having a son slash grandsons through the act with Tamar. And then Genesis 39, we have Joseph, who's in Egypt now, and he's, he's in Potiphar's household, and, and Potiphar's wife accuses him of, of, of a great offense, which leads to him being thrown into prison. Why does the Joseph story start, then hit pause and you have the Judah stuff, Judah and Tamar, and then it picks back up in Egypt? What do you think? Okay, so maybe just a, a contrast because both, both Genesis 38 and Genesis 39 is about sexual temptation and you have two different responses. Yeah? Yeah, what do you think, Daniel? Okay, so it's just like, hey, a lot of time has passed. Let's just like fill in the gaps a little bit with time. Okay. How important is Judah to the biblical storyline? Very. Very. Does Jesus descend from Joseph or Judah? Judah. Judah. And who gets blessed at the end of Genesis, Genesis 49, to have the scepter? Judah. 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 
The story of Joseph is not about Joseph at all. It is about the offspring of Judah. The story takes place to preserve the offspring of Judah. And why is Genesis 38 so important? Because it's about the preservation of the offspring of Judah. If that story did not happen, there would be no more offspring, no more seed of Judah. And everything that happens with Joseph, it's to preserve life and a remnant. So the story of Joseph is not ultimately about Joseph. It is presented as a portrait of ultimately the one who is to come, who's going to come from the line of Judah. So what scholars do is they always categorize this story as the story of Joseph and Judah, or even the story of Judah and Joseph. It's about them. And then uh, as I believe it's chapter 33, 34, or 43, 44, when we get there, the emphasis is always Judah and his brothers. Judah and his brothers. So it's not the brothers, it's Judah and the brothers. So the story um, begins, then segues, because the story is not just about Joseph. It has heavy focus on Judah. Do Genesis 37, 38, and 39 have anything in common? They all have a story of deception with a garment and a goat. Not a goat in the last one in 39, but a garment. Well, lots of adultery well it's, de- it's deception with a, gar- with a garment. So first in 37, uh, the way deception happens in 37 is they take his garment and they dip it in the blood of a goat. So rather than putting a garment on and putting goat skin on, now they slaughter the goat and they take the blood and they put it on the garment and they, they take it to Jacob and they say, do you, do you recognize this coat? And he's like, my son must have died. Ah, deceived by a garment. Then 38, what happens is Tamar changes her clothes. And it's the changing of her clothes that deceives Jacob into providing the leveret marriage right that she actually is owed, according to Torah. And then Genesis 30... He, he does promise a, a goat. Goat? Is it a goat? It's for animal. 20. 20? A young goat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, young goat. Nice. And, and then the last one, Genesis 39, uh, Potiphar's wife grabs his garment, and then she uses it, and she says, look, he left his garment. She deceives with a garment. So you have three stories of deception and the deception involves using a garment. So what happened with the Jacob and Esau story with the blessing is you had the addition to what has been the melody throughout Genesis of food being what deception is revolving around. And now the thing of food was accompanied by a garment, food and a garment. And now these stories, they just use the garment rather than using food. Uh, But we see that three in a row, all garment stories of deception. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yes, totally. And that's what we see at the end of the book. We're going to get there. Um, But even slowing down, like Genesis 39, now Joseph, he was good in form and appearance. He was really handsome. He was kind of like his mom, Rachel. And, you know, the wife of Potiphar, she really wanted him. And what she says to him is, listen to my voice, you know? She's She's calling out, but he would not listen to her voice. He would not listen to her voice. He is a better Adam who would not listen to the voice of the woman and fall into temptation. Um, A few details I want to point out. So he has these two dreams in Genesis 37. And he recounts his dreams to his brothers. Have dreams been important so far? Yeah, God, God has revealed things in dreams. He has two dreams. One, he says, you know, my sheaf arose and he stood up. And your sheaves all gathered around it, and they bowed down to my sheaf. And the brother said to him, 
The brothers are interpreting the dream. They understand the interpretation. Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him for his dreams. Have I heard of anybody in the Bible who is supposed to reign and rule? Humanity on page one, Genesis chapter one, verse 28, they were given dominion. They were given uh, reign or rule over. It's this same word that's popping up here. So one word is mashal, which means to reign. The other word is uh, malak, which also melek is king. Are you indeed going to be king over us? So they're understanding what this dream is. And then he said, well, I had another dream. <laughs> In case you, you didn't understand that one. I had another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept saying in mind. He just remembered it. So just think about what is symbolically being represented by the dream. He has a dream of the sun, the moon, and and stars bowing down to him. What does the sun and the moon represent? Father, Father and mother and the stars are? His brothers. His brothers, the, the sons of Israel, who then become the tribes. Remember, if you were with me through it last year, uh, Revelation 12, and it's a woman, and she has a crown, and on the crown there are 12 stars, the people of God, representing the people of God in this symbolic dream. So, okay, two dreams. We need some, like, grain color. So a, a sheave is just, a, like, a bundle of grain. I'm not going to draw all 11 of them, but you get the idea. <clears throat> it was like, the first dream is, he's like, my bundle of grain was standing up, and all your bundles of grain were bowing down. After they sell him into slavery, he's going to go out into Egypt, and then he's going to become second in command of all of Egypt, and there's going to be a famine where he has all these storehouses, and then his brothers are going to show up for food, which is grain. And they're not even going to realize it, but they're going to bow down to him, not knowing it's Joseph, so that they can buy some grain. So his dream is about grain bowing down, but the reality is that his brothers will bow down for grain. All right, that's the first dream. The second dream is... It's just him and the sun and the moon and all the stars are bowing down to him. And the interpretation of these dreams is, are you indeed going to reign and rule over us? Are you indeed going to be king? So... These dreams are about the, the offspring of Abraham, who's going to become a ruler, a king, and something else is going to happen. And he's also the youngest, and the brothers are bowing down to him. Yeah, and he's the most favored. And how, the brothers, they are very, very frustrated. So, you know, one day his dad says, you know what, go find your brothers. Uh, they're out pasturing the flocks. You know, and, and as he's going, um, a man, an unnamed man found him wandering in the fields. Who is this man? Well, the last unnamed man we met was God. Oh, it's just, it doesn't say, it doesn't tell us. But the man says, your brothers are that way. Go that way. So he goes, and when the brothers see him, they're like, oh, here comes, here comes the dreamer dreaming his dreams again. So they, they begin to conspire about killing him. And Reuben, he's a, a little hesitant about this. Reuben's like, ah, you know what? We, shouldn't, we probably shouldn't kill him. And his plan is, you know what? Let's throw him in a pit, and then I'll go rescue him. The re reason Reuben is doing this is because we had a, a small detail earlier that Reuben lay with his father's wife, his father's concubine which is uncovering the, the nakedness of the father. It's a, it's a grab <laughs> at control, like power over the household. So although Reuben is the firstborn, he tried to subvert his father, and therefore he's disqualified as inheriting the birthright. And there's the next two sons of, of Israel, 
are Levi and Simeon. And what they do is after the story of Dinah, they went and they slaughtered uh, the people there. And because of that, they also don't get the birthright. So now next in line is Judah. So he has this plan, though. I'm going to try and rescue him. But Joseph came to his brothers, and the first thing they do is they strip his clothes off. And Genesis 39, his clothes are also going to be stripped off. But then later, he's going to be restored, and he's going to have his clothes put on twice over. So when he is exalted in Pharaoh's court, Pharaoh clothes him when he comes out of prison, and then Pharaoh puts his robe onto Joseph. So Joseph is restored in his clothing in this story. They threw him in the pit. The pit was empty. It didn't have any water, so he's not going to drown. And then they see some Ishmaelites, some, some caravanners, and Judah comes up with this idea to sell his brother. He's like, well, if we kill him, we get no benefit. But if we sell him, we get some money. So he convinces his brothers to sell the youngest. Judah convinces to sell, and that's what they do. They lift him up out of the pit and take him into Egypt. So we have the story of the little king's son, and he's going to be thrown into a pit. But then he's going to be taken up out of the pit. And where is he going to go? He's going to go to Egypt, and he's going to be into Potiphar's house. And is he just any old scrub in Potiphar's house? No. He has put over everything in Potiphar's house. And in fact, he says, Potiphar hasn't withheld anything from me except for you, Potiphar's wife. Have we heard any other stories where God gives someone everything and withholds just one thing? Ah, Adam and Eve in the garden. Just one thing that they're not allowed to have, but they seized it for themselves. But Joseph, does he see, seize for himself the wife of Potiphar? No. First test, pass. He is a good human. Good human. He is like the Adam King figure. But then what happens is Potiphar's wife comes up with a story that, you know what, he tried to humiliate me because, you know, she's not used to being rejected by, by a man that, that she wants. So they throw him into prison. And the prison is called a pit. Thrown into a prison. But then there, even in the pit, he is put in charge of the entire pit. So even as a prisoner, he is in charge of all the prisoners because God was with him. Is this a story that like you, you see the events of his life? You're like, ah, there's someone who God is with. Sold into slavery, almost killed by his brothers, then thrown into prison. I don't look at that story and be like, ah, there, there's someone with God's favor and love on their life. You know? But apparently, according to the Bible, it is. After this, he's, he's in the prison and there's two dreams. Remember, he had two dreams. Now there's two prisoners, each have a dream. And Joseph gives the interpretation. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're each going to have your, your heads lifted. You're going to have your head lifted from sorrow and you're going to have your head lifted up off of your body because you're going to be killed. <laughs> Very, very clever, funny to read, sad to actually have happen. <laughs> but because of this, Pharaoh, uh, uh, two years later, two years later, um, Joseph is taken up out of the pit. And Joseph is put in charge of all of Egypt. That's a scepter. Pyramid. He's put in charge of all of Egypt. All of Egypt. Uh, what I'm trying to help you see, down in suffering, up into glory. Down in suffering, up into glory. This is why we looked at this last week or two weeks ago in Luke chapter 24. Jesus says, thus it is written that the Messiah, the anointed ruler figure, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. Suffering, 
and then exaltation into glory. The story of Joseph is a Jesus story pointing to the true seed of Judah. That is my daughter in the back. Um, let me show you a few more things for the remainder of our time. So uh, Genesis chapter 41. Okay, so the dreams in prison, dreams in prison take place. He gives the interpretation of the dream. And then on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, so three days after the dream, the cupbearer is restored. And now two whole years later, so it's two whole years later, but it's also the third day that Joseph is exalted up out of the pit of prison. He's taken up out of the pit, and because Pharaoh has had two dreams, two dreams, Joseph gives the interpretation, um, but when they draw him up out of prison, out of the pit in verse 14, first he's given a change of clothing, the first restoration of clothes, uh, and then they bring him before him, and jo as Joseph interprets the dreams, and he says there's going to be seven years of plentitude, then seven years of famine. What you should do is you should find someone who's wise and discerning. You should put them over all of Egypt and they should set some food aside every year of the seven years of plenty. That way you have something during the famine. And Pharaoh's response is, well, I think I found him. This guy's pretty wise and discerning and smart. So uh, he decides to exalt Joseph over all of Egypt. Um, still in verse or chapter 41, Pharaoh says, can we find a man like this in whom the spirit, in, in whom is the spirit of God? Like this seems to be someone who is animated by the spirit of God, who is wide and discerning to provide life for others. There is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. <clears throat> So the only thing that is withheld from Joseph is the throne. Everything is yours, just not the throne. All right, so another test. Remember here, it's everything is yours except for my wife. Can't have that. And he didn't take her. Now he's put in charge of all of Egypt except for the throne. He doesn't take that either. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. Now pay attention to these details. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the earth of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, and he put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments. It's the second restoration of clothes. Clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck, and he made him ride in his second chariot. Basically, it's like he's got two of the same chariots. He's got the first chariot, the second chariot. He makes Joseph ride in the second. And they called out before him, bow the knee. All the peoples are bowing to the offspring of Abraham. Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the earth of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the earth of Egypt. When you look at Joseph, what do you see? No, in this text, what do you see when you look at Joseph? He's, he, what you see is Pharaoh. Yeah. He's wearing Pharaoh's signet ring, which is basically the identifying mark of who someone is. So he's wearing the signet ring. He's wearing the royal robes. He's wearing the gold chain. He's riding in the chariot. Uh, and everything that he says is what goes. He is an image of Pharaoh. Just like we are supposed to be images of God with one thing withheld from us. Who rule on God's behalf over all the earth. Here it's localized, the earth of Egypt. The land of Egypt. But when you look at Joseph, you don't see Joseph. What you see is God. Or what you see is Pharaoh. What you see is Pharaoh. Oh, and by the way, Joseph was 30 years when all this happened. 30 years. He was in prison for two years. That's 28. He was sold into slavery at 17. So he was in Potiphar's household for 11 years. So he was there for a long time being faithful. And a lot of things were not taking place in the story that we were told. 
But here is Joseph being the image, the image of Pharaoh. Um, we'll end with this, Genesis 45. The brothers come. We're reading these stories. The brothers come. He finally reveals himself to them. And at first, they're just like super terrified because he's the most powerful man in the world. And they're like, we sold you into slavery. But Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life or to save life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. If there was a summary of the Joseph story and a summary of the book of Genesis, here it is. Like, what is Genesis trying to communicate to you? It's God's intention to bring blessing to all the families of the earth through an offspring of Abraham who suffers and then is exalted into glory to keep many survivors. Story of Jesus. This is teleological. It's pointing forward to Christ. This real story in redemptive history is a shadow of a greater story that's fulfilled in Jesus, where Jesus is betrayed by his own brothers and kin, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. And he is, uh, enters into suffering. And on the third day, he's exalted into glory and provides salvation and the forgiveness of sins to all the families of the earth so that uh, a remnant can be kept and many survivors can be had. That's what this story is doing. But to get there, we're going to have to cover a lot of ground. So we're going to finish Genesis uh, in the next few days. Pay careful attention to Genesis 49. Genesis 49 is very important, specifically verses 8 through 12. It's about Judah. Let me pray for us. Now let's go worship. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for these people and these friends. God, we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we study your word this week, as we seek to understand. And God, ultimately, we we ask that you would show us not just what you have done in redemptive history in the past, but what you did ultimately in redemptive history on the cross and what you are still doing today in our lives through your word. God, we love you and we need you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.